Hello everybody and welcome to Unlearning Economics. That's the correct view, isn't it? Um, so I'm very excited today because I've got with me uh, Dr. Daniela Gabor, um, who is a professor at the University of West England, Bristol, and specializes in finance and shadow banking and things of that persuasion. And uh, one of her big ideas at the moment is this idea of the Wall Street consensus. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gabor, for joining us. Thank you. Um, let's start by you calling me Daniela. Uh, Daniela, okay. It, it, it feels easier, <laughs> easier for everybody. Okay. So, Daniela, what 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 is the Wall Street consensus? Let's start start with the basics. Okay. Um, well, Wall Street, the Wall Street consensus is a sort of a play on the Washington consensus. Um, this uh, uh, paradigm in international development that we had since the 1980s, which argued that uh, for countries to develop. Uh, what they needed to do was to unleash market forces. Um, and the Washington Consensus came with a list of prescriptions. Uh, there were 10 policy commandments, as, as we call them, uh, organized around three basic uh, instructions, if you want, if you want um, which were to liberalize uh, both international trade and domestic markets, to privatize state-owned companies, and to stabilize the macroeconomic environment by putting central banks in charge, uh, independent central banks, putting them in charge of, of inflation and sort of downgrading uh, fiscal authorities to a second fiddle in the macroeconomic policy um, a sort of uh, institutional framework. Uh, fiscal authorities uh, being expected to not um, do very much and particularly to not uh, engage in sort of populist fiscal expansions that would uh, undermine the task of uh, targeting inflation. Now, this paradigm, the Washington Consensus, became very contested uh, for uh, reasons that uh, uh, are, were very clear once you looked at the, at the outcomes, uh, particularly because unleashing market forces uh, didn't generate either the kind of development that it promised and came with very significant uh, social costs and, and uh, distributional consequences. Now, the Wall Street consensus comes on the back of this paradigm. It's uh, promoted by the World Bank, by the International Monetary Fund, by the G20, um, a host of initiatives, particularly since the uh, 20, since 2015, but you can trace a sort of longer history of it if you want. And, and it starts by recognizing that the idea of an unleashing market forces, and that will deliver on all the sort of development ambitions that we have, this idea didn't, doesn't really work in practice to the extent and the scale that is necessary to achieve either the sustainable development goals or uh, to deal with the climate crisis. So what is needed, uh, starting from this market failure, is to um, crowd in private capital or to mobilize private capital to both bring in the state as an agent that does the mobilization of private capital, but to also think about how to make development investable. And, and by this, I mean, uh, if you want to have a new hospital uh, and you don't have as a state fiscal resources, because there are some very clear assumptions about what the state can and cannot do with fiscal resources, uh, then what you need to do is to convince BlackRock or uh, another large uh, asset manager from the global north who is sitting on tri trillions of US dollars that could invest. You need to convince them to come and invest in your country, to convince them to invest in this, in this hospital. You need to think very carefully about the question, why don't they invest on their own? Why doesn't the market provide this on its own? And the answer is, well, the market doesn't provide this because... Uh, the risk return profile of this hospital is not uh, um, fully aligned with what an, an, an investor would expect. In other words, either risks are too high or returns are too low. So the Wall Street consensus is a very kind of com comprehensive way of thinking how to adjust, adjust risk returns, how to move some risks from the balance sheet of uh, private finance or private capital onto the balance sheet of the state to make uh, development projects uh, investable. And it's not just hospitals, it's schools, it's uh, other social infrastructure, it's water, it's climate, it's nature, forests, everything can become an asset class. And I think this vocabulary is very important because it is the vocabulary of private finance brought into the, um, the uh, debates around international development. Yeah, it's a very good explanation. I mean, it's interesting because the the Washington consensus is regarded correctly as a highly free market 
kind of ultra Chicago school orthodox position where you just deregulate everything, privatize everything, cut taxes and so on. Um, but I think it seems like the prevailing narrative is that the IMF and World Bank and these other organizations in the USA um, have moved away from this type of free market thinking. And I suppose the way you describe it, in a sense, they have, um, because they're acknowledging that there are some things markets can't do alone. But they're still, from what you say, they're still just basically enacting these policies at the service of, of private capital in a way that will be favorable to markets. And you, you have this idea of de-risking, right, which mm -hmm. is really important. So could you maybe explain that? Thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, just to, to clarify, in, in some of the debates that I've had around the, the concept of de-risking, uh, people usually say, well, uh, Daniela Gabor came up with it. Uh, this is not my term. Um, it's a term that has been used both by um, a, a large um, international development organizations like the United, Na United Nations Development Program, uh, or by the World Bank. Uh, it's used by anybody that has a, a logic or, or promotes a logic of mobilizing private capital. And the idea of de-risking is, is very simple and in, in some ways also very kind of intuitive, uh, is to say, well, you need to de-risk um, assets, you need to de-risk development projects for private capital. In other words, to move risks from, the, from private capital to to the state and how do you do that just to give you an example there are many different vehicles through which you can do the risking you can for example uh, give uh, loans on preferential terms to uh, a private wind farm in kenya uh, that is the risking because it changes the risk return profile on that wind farm that you're investing in you can enter a public private partnership uh, with uh, that wind farm in kenya and uh, in, in, in the legal terms of that, uh, that uh, uh, public-private partnership, what the state uh, commits itself to do is to buy uh, the energy produced through the wind farm at a certain price. So it guarantees a, a predictable cash flow. So if you want to think about the risking is a way of saying, well, I as Black, BlackRock would like to have predictable cash flows, would like to have bankable projects. For that, I need to know that the state is there helping uh, with the predictability of of those uh, cash flows i mean i mean how common is this approach in in development do you, i mean you use a lot of examples in your paper but is it fair to say that most projects that go ahead do so with this kind of de-risking this kind of enabling uh wall street mm. so it i would say first if we look at the at the discourse of international institutions uh, from the World Bank to any other multilateral development bank in Afri on the African continent, on the Asian continent, the logic of uh, getting finance, right? Because this is in, essentially boils down to a financing question. Uh, how do we do the things that we want to do, given uh, our view or our understanding that we cannot change the relationship between the central bank and the Ministry of Finance or the Fiscal Author Authority to sort of basically create endogenously the kind of finance and endogenously and locally the kind of finance that we need for public projects. Well, if you if you start from the position you can't do that, then obviously you go into well we have to we have to de-risk, and it's there in most uh, um, not just at international level, and there are many different de-risking instruments. If you look at the U at the European Union Global Ga Gateway, it's a logic of de-risking is infused through it. Uh, the U.S. Uh, international uh, infrastructure partnerships uh, that, again, is trying to push back a little bit against uh, what they perceive to be China's uh, 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 sort of increasing geopolitical influence in the global south. Uh, it's, it's, it's there at the international level at the, in terms of the geopolitical uh, struggles that are taking place between, let's say, institutions in the, uh, and, and countries in the global north and China, but it's there also at, at country level. So most uh, uh, projects for or, or uh, strategies for decarbonizing energy from Indonesia to Brazil to South Africa to uh, Kenya uh, are based on the logic of the risking. The moment you, you, are, you, you, you think about uh, decarbonization or you think about the climate mm -hmm. crisis as a question of mobilizing foreign capital, of going to uh, trying to tap into the trillions of institutional investors, uh, particularly from the global north, you end up uh, with a logic of the risking. Then you you end up by thinking, okay, how do I make my whatever public policy ambition 
How do I make it attractive for Wall Street? This is basically what, what this boils down to. And you can do it in very different ways. And of course, it's not, it's not a, let's say, a, everywhere. Uh, it's not hegemonic on every single uh, project that the state does everywhere. There are still public, uh, 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 publicly owned um, uh, infrastructure projects or, yeah. or, or now I've argued uh, in my recent research, this logic of de-risking is also moving into green industrial policy. But I would say there is a concerted effort at global level to make de-risking uh, the, the way or the, the logic of economic statecraft or the, the, the new way to articulate the state, uh, the relationship between state and private capital. So, I mean, whereas before with the Washington consensus, you would cut everything and then say and then basically <laughs> have nothing in its place now you're cutting everything but you're giving something in its place but it is basically investment from american and presumably to an extent eu-led finance right i mean what mm. what are the benefits of this approach or, or the perceived benefits like how how do its its proponents see it but this is a very Im important question, I think. Why does the risking have such political appeal? And let me just first take a step back and notice that the the one of the main initiatives that have propelled the risking and, and kind of energized the risking as a as a development paradigm under this Wall Street consensus umbrella uh, is the uh, um, United Nations Financing for Development Conference uh, in Addis Abeba in, in twenty fifteen. Uh, that was entitled uh, From Billions to Trillions, the idea that we have to mobilize trillions in private capital and to, to kind of channel it to flow from the global north into the global south in development projects. And for, for governments in the global south, this is an attractive proposition. The risking is, attract, is an attractive proposition because what it says to, to, to politicians is you don't need to engage in radical transformations of your macroeconomic policy institutions you don't need to uh, realign or to, to get rid of this uh, monetary dominance framework where the central bank targets pr price stability and the fiscal authority does what it can without obstructing this. You don't need to change radically anything. What you need to do is basically uh, think, uh, tinker or play with price signals in this, in this project, make it a bit more attractive for private capital to crowd it in. So to me, the, there is a, a, a kind of both political appeal in the sense that it tells politicians in, the, in, in countries in the global south, you can do large infrastructure projects, even if you don't have public uh, finance, uh, the public money for it. You just have to give, redirect some of your fiscal resources into uh, a, a making or into mobilizing, uh, enabling private investment. Um, but it's, it also has a kind of institutional appeal because it says you don't need to change massively anything, right? So you think about the climate crisis. When we talk about the climate crisis, we think and we accept from, I guess, across the political spectrum, we accept that it requires a radical transformation of domestic, both infrastructure and productive structures, right? You have to change everything in order to shrink the carbon footprint of your economic activity, of your infrastructure. And the Wall Street consensus says, well, great, I have a solution for you that doesn't require massive institutional change. I have a solution for you that doesn't require you to build up state capacity to a great extent. And we know state capacity has been very severely eroded by the Washington consensus. What you need to do is you need to sit down with BlackRock or with institutional investors, with Aberdeen Asset Management. You need to sit down with philanthropies like the Tony Blair Institute, who's, for example, been very instrumental in designing this de-risking based approach to Indonesia's um, uh, mm -hmm. Decarboni decarbonization of the energy sector. So you need to sit down with them, think about partnerships, frame your development projects through the logic of, of partnerships with, with private capital, and and that, that's it, you're done. So it's it's politically, it's very appealing. Um, mm. And I can see why, because, uh, you know, if you live with four-year electoral cycles, um, you think, what in four years, maybe I can get BlackRock to build me two wind farms and, and one green hydrogen plant. It, it appeals to both the lazy and the corrupt, um, which is a pretty pretty good place to to sit, right? Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's funny to think, you know, over the past, I mean, even over the past 10 years, you know, the growth of these foundations and like NGOs, public-private partnerships is all you really see. And, and it does seem to be our dominant approach to managing development now. Mm. 
Yeah, and if you the philanthropies are everywhere, everywhere their 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 footprints or their fingerprint is mm-hmm. is all over those uh, those uh, 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 projects and and in in the kind of elite spaces in the global north where these uh, issues are uh, are being discussed, because they are also de- important development players. We have to to accept that they are uh, important development players, and because uh, philanthropies as a as an overall kind of you know. Uh, uh, logic, they do not come with wanting radical institutional change. They want to promote, a, 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 or they, of, of course, there are exceptions, but in general, philanthropies have, have the, the the political urge behind this to do it sort of incremental change and, and nudging towards the sustainable development goals. And of course, you have to, to ask yourself, well, do we want these philanthropies to play such an, uh, an important role in um, in, in kind of shaping development paradigms, to which, and I'm, I'm hoping we'll get to this, uh, because in terms of distributional consequences, or even in terms of the way in which it, it reimagines the state, the Wall Street consensus is not that different from the Washington consensus. Mm. It, as you rightly pointed out, it still it still pushes for the privatization of public goods, for the privatization of, of social goods, for the privatization of the social contract between the state and its citizens. But it has an added layer, which to me is fascinating. It doesn't say the market will do, if we privatize, the market will will deliver. It says we have to bribe these private actors into doing the things that we used to do as a state. We have to bribe them to provide education. We have to bribe them to provide uh, pub, uh, health. We have to bribe them to provide clean water or or or, or forest or clean forests. I mean, it seems like to, from listening to you, I sort of formulated that three potential or maybe not potential maybe real problems with uh, the wall street consensus which is one yeah. there's the intrinsic argument right where you're saying do we want development to be in the hands of people who are basically insulated from um democracy um and there's also the argument about other consequences right there's you know distributional consequences like you said inequality rising um and then there's also the question which i, I want to pose to you if does it achieve its stated goals? I mean, is it is it just a bad way of, of trying to achieve outcomes? Well, I mean, it depends how you want to think about what are what what is success and and who who benefits and how on whose terms can we can we define success? And let me start by saying, um, in, in answering the, this question, let me start by saying that. In general, if you ask what the World Bank officials or if you ask the African Development Bank, what they would say to you is that so far, this idea of mobilizing private capital, of uh, moving from billions to trillions, has not delivered in practice. In, 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 in practice, if you look at the numbers themselves, there isn't that much private capital that has been scaled up into uh, investable projects uh, in the global south. And the, the, the question that the, the, this kind of promoters of the, of the risking ask themselves is why has this been the case? Why don't we have enough or why, why do, do, don't the ambitions to, to, to channel trillions of US dollars into countries in the global south, why haven't they materialized? And one answer that you, uh, you hear very often from these uh, uh, promoters of the risking is well uh, we haven't actually finished the job of institution building in countries in the global south or to put it differently there hasn't been enough institutional rewiring of the state to accept to absorb the kind of risks that uh, on on a scale that would that would leverage or would dramatically increase um, the volume of cri- private capital that is flowing uh, into um, uh, investable development, and uh, if you look, for example, at the uh, the new uh, president of the World Bank, and uh, the efforts of the United States. So the United States, with the Biden administration, as you rightly pointed out, uh, and uh, if you read the speeches of Jake Sullivan, which is one of the sort of uh, intellectual architects of the of the Biden administration's Bidenomics and its international policy decisions. Um, uh, what they what they say there is well we need to find ways of accelerating um, this uh, journey from billions to trillions we need to find ways of of, of scaling up 
and that requires, uh, and, and this is where my, my critique of this uh, um, particular development paradigm comes in, uh, in, in order to do that, we, we can't just have multilateral development banks or, or official development aid from the global north putting the money in for the risking or absorbing some of the risks. It has to be um, the, uh, more fiscal resources from countries in the global south. So this is, it, to me, it's a it's a it's a young development paradigm. It has a lot of elite uh, sort of push behind it. It re but it requires a lot more institutional building. You know, paradigms and 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 massive changes in institutional structure don't come overnight. So if you if I look at the range of re recent initiatives from the United States, but also from multilateral development banks from the European Union, they're all trying to accelerate the, the, the Wall Street consensus to, to, to build stronger institutional foundations for it. It's always bothered me that idea. It's, I guess it's the idea that's come out of development over the past 20, 30 years, which is that if poorer countries aren't developing, then we just need to give them exactly the same institutions as uh, as richer countries, you know, and, and basically remake them in our image. I mean, uh, are, there, are there countries that have kind of bucked this trend that have, have gone with their own institutions, their own form of development, whatever that might mean? Well, um, so as you yes let let's let's first agree on the on the on the on this kind of di implicit diagnostic which mm. is uh that they need to do a bit more of what we're doing although i'm going to bracket this and maybe we can get to the us inflation reduction act because mm -hmm. in that sense in in that particular space what the us is doing with the green industrial policy my, uh, actually actually suggests that not all countries and probably only the the the, EU, the international hegemon can do the kind of things that um that the paradigm itself suggests mm -hmm. everybody could do um but the 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 overall so in in research that i've done with ndongo sambasila where we look at green hydrogen as a kind of terrain where to think about um not to, to think about the Wall Street consensus not just simply as a totalizing, you know, narrative and the totalizing paradigm that you get, gets to a country and all of a sudden, you know, completely captures the imaginations of the imagination of politicians, captures the imagination of technocrats, and that's it. They, they, they all become the risking states. But what we we say with Ndongo Sambasila is that there is some kind of opening for reimagining a, a more autonomous uh, development paradigm that starts with building state capacity, right? Because the, the question to me of doing development in a, dif a different way or, or doing gr um, cl climate policy in a different way fundamentally has to start with building state capacity to organize decarbonization or to organize a, a, a kind of tra transformation of economic models. and. Of course, well, we have to ask what is necessary for the, for building up the state capacity. But you could you could argue, well, you know, maybe in in the ideological opening that we have at the moment, where the state is back, and many progressives, many of my friends are applauding this in ways that I find uh, that that I I'm I'm not quite sure that I can share the optimism. Where I am to some extent optimist is that once you open up the space to say the state has to come back. Maybe there is scope now to think about how can the state come back in a way that doesn't uh, uh, transform countries or doesn't lock countries in the same old patterns of unequal ecological exchange. Because if, let's say, let me give you the example of the Indonesia's um, energy decarbonization strategy. Well, Indonesia is a very interesting country for a variety of reasons. Uh, because it's very big, because it's very, uh, it has a, a political leadership that is, that is very ambitious, and because its uh, position as an exporter of nickel uh, has given it some leverage to start thinking about, you know, to to go go back to a kind of traditional develop, developmental mindset, and the developmental mindset. Um, um, to put it very, very briefly and crudely, basically says if you want to have to to, to compete successfully in the existing uh, international division of, of labor in the existing global productive structures, what you need is you need to upgrade your your local industries in a way that that generates kind of exports that are increasingly more uh, value added, 
And Indonesia said, well, okay, well, why don't we leverage our our uh, kind of critical minerals uh, and and force companies to process them in our country and to kind of spread or 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 train local capital into being able to sort of at some point compete on, on its own. So it's there is there is a, a, a an, an opening. Countries can start to to build their own uh, um, sort of state capacity to do that. It is a very long uh, process, and of course, it has to go hand in hand by by necessity in some ways and by political pressure with the with also the 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 logic of the risking that is coming from from all these international actors that are are saying to Indonesia. Uh, well, you know, if you want to get four trillion U.S. dollars uh, in investment over the next decade in in your uh, in moving towards uh, decarbonizing your energy sector, you have to do it with foreign capital. You can't do it on its own, on your own. It's just not possible. So these these two logics are there, and uh, they are competing with each other, and they are uh, and and there are ways to navigate this, um, but they are not easy easy ways to navigate this Ex external pressure for de risking with the internal. Uh, let's say internal political consensus building around a, a more developmental mindset where you're thinking i want my own productive structures i want my own local capital to do the things that uh, to 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 export and to build up technology technological abilities um uh, in a in a kind of more sustained way and it seems like there just remains this massive aversion to just having states, you know, mobilize a lot of resources and expertise and good planning, um, you know, hopefully uh, democratic states. But, you know, in order to achieve certain developmental outcomes, right, like, you know, health and education and um, some institution building as well, but doing it their own way. I mean, um, I, I guess... Is, does, what's purpose does that serve? Because, I mean, it's one thing to say that people are ideologically a averse to that. Um, but, I mean, does it relate to things like the, the hegemony of the US dollar? Is there is there this kind of idea of... I mean, people in my chat, uh, I don't think you can see, are talking about, like, undevelopment or underdevelopment, you know, as a verb, right? Is, is, is it related to this idea, the Wall Street consensus? Well, the idea, the idea of underdevelopment to me, uh, suggests a, a kind of international division of 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 labor and and a specific kind of a, a specific relationship between high income countries, particularly the U.S. and 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 low or middle income countries, in which it uh, it, it becomes increasingly difficult for countries in the global south to go up uh, value chains. And and the Washington Consensus, to me, is a good example of how. You know the production of underdevelopment it has a very specific political character, and and it requires institutions uh, uh, or institution building to 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 make that underdevelopment uh, real. Now, um, the the extent to which the Wall Street consensus does it reproduce the the logic of underdevelopment, I would say, I mean, it does it to the extent that uh, it suggests partnerships with foreign capital are enough to to generate any kind of developmental outcome be beyond the sustainable development goals because typically this is discussed in relationship to the to the sustainable development goals and there is not much emphasis on productive structures uh, the emphasis on production and you know on clean tech for example comes after the uh, the US shifts to the uh, inflation reduction act and all of a sudden it it becomes again uh, kind of normalized to think about industrial policy as a legitimate uh, space for state action. Um, so the, the pressures for underdevelopment are there because, you know, if you if if you go through the whole logic of the Wall Street consensus, and I'm, I'm just going to use the example of Indonesia again, because I've been mm -hmm. reading their um, energy, they have something called a blueprint for um, a strategic blue, blueprint for decarbonization. And, and what they what what the strategic blueprint for decarbonization uh, argues and it's been written by the Boston Consulting Group and the Tony Blair Institute and several others. Uh, what it says, well, you know, if Indonesia is going to massively adopt renewable energies, uh, then of course it will generate demand for uh, clean tech, for solar panels, for green hydrogen, for uh, wind farms, for wind turbines. And by generating this demand, this will encourage local production of this uh, of this uh, clean tech, right? But what we know, even with the example of Germany in the in the early two thousands, what we know is that uh, 
the most likely outcome without the Indonesian state doing specific green industrial policy to make sure that, that the local demand is met by local supply, it will be either China or the US who will be benefiting uh, by exporting uh, clean tech to countries in the global south. So this, this to me is, is the, the, the important question. Is there a way to make sure that your, uh, uh, that your let's say, in some ways, quite a, a st strong impulse towards decarbonization as, as a question of economic policy, does it generate local demand for um, local production? And does it upgrade manufacturing, uh, clean manufacturing structures? Or does it just transform you into, into both an importer of clean tech from countries that are uh, aggressively subsidizing their own um, clean tech sectors and into, into a producer of um, yield for uh, the black cross of, of this world? Yeah, okay. I mean, it's just it's the classic kind of classic uh, core periphery type thing, right? Where you've just got the, the all the high tech or most of the high tech is done in in the richer countries, and the poorer countries are more at the at the mercy of you know commodities, markets, volatile world prices, and and of course now more so than ever finance, right? Yeah. Um, so you've mentioned the IRA a few times. Um, the, I was in I was in Ireland the, recently, and everyone every time they said uh, the IRA, they had to <laughs> specify not that IRA, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act by by Joe Biden. Now you've been you've been quite critical of it. I mean, I saw a, a panel you had with Adam Tooze, um, and then you two were sort of you had a bit of an exchange afterwards. And you know, I'm a bit of a fan of the IRA um, mm. again, the Biden one, um, because I just I, I think. You know, I think it's it's great that governments are actually doing something. Maybe that's just part of it. It's like we've had so few wins um, on the left. And uh, I think it seems like it has been quite successful with inflation in the USA, like compared to the mm. UK, you know, they've done so much better. Um, and some of the climate action that, that he's taken. But I mean, you see it as broadly, I think, fitting still into the Wall Street consensus. So could you explain that? So let me first let me first start by saying that I I I share and understand uh, the enthusiasm on on the left for seeing the state coming back and doing something right mm. but I, but to me the critical question that comes after 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 that is what exactly is the state doing how do we think about the the, the this new uh, um, alignment between state and private capital and my critique of the Inflation Reduction Act is not so much that the state is back, because of course, as a as a post Keynesian, I've always thought that the state is very important, and leaving it to to uh, private interests uh, is is a strategic mistake. But uh, when I look at how the state is back and what kind of relationship with private capital it produces, that's where I start to worry, because what we know from um, the experience of countries that successfully did build up. Uh, or successfully develop develop their, their their local industries, is that to to have a a, a successful industrial policy, you 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 don't uh, just use carrots for private capital. You don't just bribe them into um, uh, sort of a pushing or investing in the strategic sectors which are the uh, you have identified with your with your industrial policy, but you also need. Uh, sticks. You also need to make sure that you have an institutional framework which monitors good performers, uh, performer, performance, which punishes or disciplines bad performance. And, and this is not something that the IRA is doing. The Inflation Reduction Act is basically a lot of carrots through tax credits for, um, for private uh, capital. It's, I read it as a, a continuation of the logic of the Wall Street consensus that says you put private capital in the driving seat for any kind of policy priority do you have, and you just give it some uh, subsidies or you give it, give it some support, you take some of the risks away, uh, it's still a market-led logic. And, and that's why, to me, the Inflation Reduction Act, we can... We can uh, Think about the extent to which you can uh, you can attribute the the falling inflation to to the IRA. I'm I'm a bit more skeptical than than you are. What I will recognize, and I think this is very very interesting, is that the you know it has produced very significant uptick. You you will see almost a vertical line in in in, in investment in manufacturing in the in the United States. 
um, what what I uh, see with Adaptic is that it has created the conditions for a resurgence of of organized labor in 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 particularly in the car manufacturing sector in electric vehicles, but not only. So there are some openings, but still my my concern about the Inflation Reduction Act is that as industrial policy, it might be successful because it is so incredibly generous compared to other countries in, in the kind of carrots it gives to private to private capital, but it is not good climate policy. To have good climate policy as a state, you, you have to simultaneously support the emergence of, of green sectors and, and the, the, the expansion of, of, of green sectors, but you also have to shrink dirty sectors. And this is where the US IRA is, is, in my view, quite fundamentally flawed because it really does not discipline dirty capital in the way, for example, and I've written about this at length because of my interest in, in central banking, in the way that uh, the European Union, for a brief period of, of time, when the Trump was in charge, was president in the United States, and the United States was not a significant participant in any conversations on, on climate, in that opening, when the he hegemon was absent, we could have a, a, a state project for decarbonization that didn't just give carrots, but also thought about these designing sticks. So I guess your your... I don't want to accuse you of making a prediction, but your the, the vision you're sketching out is is one where you have much higher investment in renewable energy, but because fossil fuels also supply high returns to Wall Street, you know they don't go down. And you've got a it's kind of like Jevons paradox in a way, isn't it? It's like yeah, we get more of this, but we don't get less of that. So actually, overall emissions may may well carry on increasing. Exactly the the, the 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 scale and the the, the questions of, of time and and and, and, and urgency that we have in uh, in the in decarbonization in particular, but I would also say in the I, I don't necessarily like the sustainable development goal framing. There are lots of different types of critiques to it, but in also in, in social uh, goals that we have. They are not these these uh, questions of time and urgency are not to to my mind consistent with uh, uh, the, the risking approach, which basically creates carrot based partnerships with with uh, with private capital. That's I suppose my my most um, my most significant concern. And I often think about Shell, you know, I, because uh, in Europe we have been going through three or four years since 2018 up to 2022, there were four years of intense political struggles around a framework for decarbonization that that both supported uh, green activities and thought about penalizing or disciplining dirty activities and dirty capital, right? And Shell and other uh, fossil fuel companies were at the beginning had a, a political strategy of engaging with European, um, uh, both European uh, governments and European regulators at the European Central Bank or the European Commission, engaging in a kind of goodwill sign that said, look, we are also recognizing that climate is a problem. We know that we have to shrink our our carbon footprint. We will do it in a kind of voluntary way. We will design transition plans. We have will adopt uh, ESG, environmental, social, and, and governance standards. You don't need to push us a lot. Look at our uh, renewable um, uh, investments. The capitalism is dealing with this. And what we now know for the last year, Shell has basically said, you know what, I'm not going to do renewables anymore. This is uh, I'm, I'm going to just stick with with the things that uh, produce profit for me. So the fact that, and and I suppose this uh, goes to a more fundamental theoretical critique of the logic of the risking, which is the risking is co continues with this market based idea that all you need to do in order to decarbonize is to correct price signals, right? So what the what the state does is basically it it goes at project level and it. it it, it tinkers with price signals around to make it a bit more profitable for private capital to invest. But the problem with this approach is that market price signals and markets generate all sorts of other price signals. Uh, and, and these other price signals might, might kind of nullify or, or, or weaken the effect, the effect of state intervention. And just to, to give you just one example from the UK, 
we know that we've had several uh, failed uh, uh, auctions in, in wind farms, uh, in contracts for difference, uh, because the, the, the UK state, uh, believing that, you know, with renewable energy, the, the cost of renewable energy will, will go down, uh, the prices will go down, then the, the, the British state gave less and less price guarantees to to private capital and now the uh, we we had what my friends in in the commonwealth uh, think tank call a green capital strike you know there is space for for private capital to say well you know you're not giving me enough de-risking you're not you're not assuming enough risks given the fact that for example central banks have raised interest rates and and so the price signal is now getting kind of moved all over the place you need to give me more and this, this possibility of a constant blackmail from private capital to obtain more from the state in order to continue with the project of, of investing in, in state priorities, this is very, very real. And, and it, it is, in a sense, again, to me, it, it's both it reorienting the state towards uh, validating private uh, profits, but it's also increasing the the demands on the state to validate these private profits. Mm. It, it's like um, even even if you achieve a given outcome in the short term, it makes it kind of fragile, right? It's like what if private capital just decides it's going to withdraw, like Shell have done, and says, you know, this isn't this isn't for me anymore, mm. unless you provide maybe even more even more sweeteners, and you just end up basically with the state being a funnel from from the people to to private capital i suppose that would be the the outcome of the extreme mm. outcome of something like the ira right well i, I mean I, I grew up in romania after the fall of communism and and every single rich romanian that i can think of has become rich by funneling money from the from the state into their own into their own company so i i've i've, I've grown up with this i think it is it is a, a, a distinguishing feature of capitalism. I wouldn't call it political capitalism because, you know, it, it is more to that than, than just pol uh, the politics. Uh, but certainly there is a danger that, you know, if you put private capital at the, at the top of the table in the driving seat, then of course they're going to drive it. And then of course they're going to try to get better and better uh, kind of sweets and and desserts out of you it just it works like this this is this is the logic of how the system works mm -hmm. and and one thing you've mentioned but we didn't really delve into and, and you've done some some work on this before is how this relates to central bank independence right um because mm -hmm. that's another pillar of what well, you could call it neoliberalism really right you, you had the washington consensus and deregulation and thatcherism and everything um but we do also have independent central banks and they're only, well, they're, they're, I mean, their role has changed so much even over the past few years, right? But the idea was that they they were independent from governments and they only engaged mm. in limited operations into financial markets in order to manage inflation. Um, mm. I mean, how, how is, th is this related to the Wall Street consensus, do you think? Well, I mean, it is to, to a very significant extent because the, the we arrive at the risking as a as a the only option for the state to achieve its new to to meet new challenges that are very significant uh, by saying that there is not enough public money uh, to be able to uh, invest or or build state owned um, assets or state owned uh, uh, projects uh, in say I don't know hospitals or energy. So to me, the, the, the macrofinancial anchor of the Wall Street consensus is precisely this idea of monetary dominance, this institutional framework of monetary dominance that we have from, from the Washington consensus and we have from neoliberalism, which says the central bank can only do and should do only one thing, which is price stability to uh, an independent central bank that is operationally independent, even if the, the government can, of course, change the, the level of mm. the price, which is, is targeted. No, no government will probably try to do that because it's politically too costly uh, a, a battle to move from 2% to 4%. Um, but it is, it, is, it is fundamental because we know there are other institutional arrangements and relationships between the central bank and the Ministry of Finance, which would change the, po the politics of fiscal space, right? Uh, fundamentally, the Wall Street consensus is a narrative about with little fiscal space that is, in a sense, determined by the 
the, the, the dominating position of the central bank in the institutional arrangement. With little fiscal space, all you can do is rely on, on private institutional capital. Now, I have to say that, however, with the increasing shift towards market-based finance, and this is part of the story that I tell about why the Wall Street consensus looks as it does, it, it, it looks as it, as it does because for the last 40 years, we've moved from what, whatever we want to call a kind of textbook understanding of, of the financial system. This was never the same in practice, but let's let's assume for for the sake of the argument that we can describe the financial system as you know a bank-based financial system where banks create loans, they issue deposits, those de deposits are used um, by society as means of settlement, so they, they make money, a very fundamental institution of capitalism. We've moved from that, let's say, simplistic notion to a, a, a financial uh, structure that is dominated by institutional capital. And by institutional capital, I mean here pension funds, insurance companies, uh, private equity funds, and asset managers for, for these large institutional cash pools. And we have moved into that direction precisely because the state has been walking back on its social uh, commitments towards its citizens, right? I mean, if we still had uh, public... Uh, pension funds provided by the state directly without the, uh, the intermediation of, of private finance, or if we had a, um, insurance for old age that, again, comes from the state rather from the market, this institutional capital would be much smaller. But institutional capital is very large. It's very politically powerful. It's very uh, infrastructurally, infrastructurally powerful. And where this takes us, it, it takes us into well, you know, you have a you have a financial system uh, where you have to recognize or or try to harness this institutional capital towards your objectives, without trying to change or or shrink it. I mean, we had initiatives in from 2008 to 2015 because that was a, a very serious uh, crisis of market-based finance. Um, I promised uh, we promised. Uh, uh, in before we started the meeting, I won't bore you with repo markets. I mean, they're <laughs> part of the story, but but they don't have to, have to be here. Um, but what th that that short political window of opportunity to try to shrink market-based finance is now completely closed. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not it, it's not there. And but for, for it 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 has some in in some ways still pushed central banks to do new things, right? So the central banks in high-income countries they also do the risking, and actually they were the first. Uh, a, um, public institution to do the risking on a massive scale because any kind of market maker of last resort intervention in government bond markets, which goes against the logic of monetary dominance, is done for the same kind of de-risking purposes: is to to preserve the investability, the attract, uh, 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 um, attraction, uh, attractiveness, sorry, mm. of government bonds. Right. So central banks have done have become in a sense they they are the first de-riskers on on a massive scale. Mm. And they also try to move a little bit beyond the risking, I, I would argue, if you look at green central banking policy. And I don't know if you want me to tell you a bit more about why I think that there we can, fi we can find some attempts to discipline dirty capital. Yeah, which... please, please do. <laughs> okay, very quickly. So yeah. uh, very quickly, uh, uh, central banks, uh, particularly the Bank of England and the European Central Bank, the Bank of England under Mark Carney, who then became uh, Mark Carney? I would say he's one of the high priests of, of the Wall Street consensus uh, because he speaks about it directly and indirectly because he's in charge of the uh, of um, a global finance alliance for net zero G funds, uh, which is a set of uh, financial institutions that are that are again promoting this idea of of um, uh, mobilizing private capital for 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 the crisis, and in uh, at the European Central Bank, Madame Lagarde. Uh, both have managed to make a um, climate uh, as a within a mandate uh, uh, issue for central banks. That is to say that you the central bank can't just think about price stability, but it also has to think about um, um, the climate crisis and the extent to which they are participants, they are uh, in actors in the climate crisis. And this is very important because the logic of monetary dominance, right? It says, if I want to remain an independent central bank, I can't do credit policy. I can't prefer certain sectors and punish other sectors. I just have to separate myself both from the state and fiscal policy by not buying government bonds, 
And I also have to separate myself from private credit allocation by basically only changing the interest rate on my on my loans to the banking system. And then the market does the rest of, of pricing, right? So all private credit creation is ultimately a, a, a decision of the private financial system. But once you start to think about climate as a central bank, you cannot stick with that logic of market neutrality. And we heard this from uh, the European Central Bank's uh, Isabel Schnabel, uh, Christine Lagarde also recognized it. Before Andrew Bailey took control of the Bank of England, they also recognized it, that market neutrality for central banks means that in practice, central banks are validating uh, the uh, market failure to price carbon, to price the climate crisis. They are basically saying, well, if Shell has low interest, low financing costs in the bond market, because they are large and they've issued lots of bonds, and there is no incentive for private finance to, to price climate in, in or the, the climate destruction that Shell is, is delivering on a daily basis, there is no incentive for them to price it because, you know, why would they? Then we, by buying Shell bonds, we are basically reproducing this market failure. We are ourselves subject and promoters of a, of a carbon bias. And the moment you start to recognize a carbon bias in your monetary policy operations, like the ECB did, then you have to do credit policy. There is no way, way around it, because then you have to say, well, to get rid of my carbon bias, I have to basically shift my the 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 the, the, the to change the treatment of corporate bonds that I buy directly from the market under unconventional monetary policy or that I accept as collateral in my monetary uh, policy operations, I have to shift the treatment to correct the market failure to price carbon. And this is what the European Central Bank has done. And it's probably one of the most exciting to my mind. I mean, it's, it's very technical, so people don't get as excited as I do clearly, but it's one of the most exciting initiatives because the tilting, this idea of, of shifting from dirty to green um, in um, corporate bond portfolios for the for the European Central Bank, what they put in place with a nine months program, it only lasted nine months for a variety of reasons that again have to do with monetary dominance. In this nine months program, the state created through the central bank capacity to discipline private capital mm -hmm. and to monitor the performance of dirty credit creation, and that we have we don't have anywhere else. And to me, it's kind of it's the incipient foundations for kind of central bank led um, or, or central planning in the world of, of central banks, because it forced the ECB to basically say, you know, I can't just pretend that Shell is going to do the things that it's promising to do. I'm going to make sure that I monitor them and their transition plans on a constant basis. And this is what they, they, they had in place with the with the tilting framework. So beyond the very very um, uh, complex technicalities of what the, how do you change the composition of your corporate bond uh, uh, portfolio. What the ECB did do for nine months is to to set up a or to 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 massively beef up state capacity for disciplining private capital, much more than the Inflation Reduction Act, much more than any other uh, mm. uh, state initiative I can think of in the global north in the in the past twenty years. Yeah, these are, these are the sticks that you were talking about that were so absent from the IRA, right? I mean, yeah. Indeed. It's indeed. interesting. I was going to ask you because I, I did say, I, I did write in my questions, I was like, sometimes a, a consensus, a paradigm can contain the seeds of its own destruction and we can use it to, to destroy it, right? And so <laughs> with this, it does seem that central banks, as their role has grown, and especially over the pandemic, you know, now the Fed is basically the central bank of the world, right? Um, and mm. and they, they've started to do more and more. They can no longer ignore the role they play in the economy, and they're going to have to engage in some disciplining of private capital to achieve climate goals, which would be very much against the Wall, the Wall Street consensus because that would mean lower returns for those for those involved, right? So that is exciting. I, I agree with you. That's really exciting. I mean, it it is exciting as an idea. Unfortunately, it, it we have had a tactical defeat. I would I choose to think it as a tactical defeat <laughs> rather than a strategic defeat. Because it only lasted for nine months at the European Central Bank, and and uh, the the ECB dropped it in mm. June this year, in June 2023, in the month that was probably the most destructive in terms of climate indicators that we've had oh. in a very long time. 
uh, and I found it very ironic. Yes. But it, it, it also, again, um, illustrates the importance of thinking about the macrofinancial framework in which we live. Because the ECB, under very significant both internal and external pressure, was forced or, or was forced to give in to the to its critics because uh, you know inflation became the 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 overall alpha and omega of everything that the ECB had to do and Madame Lagarde was w- worried that she would be known as Madame Climate um, and so under the the logic of monetary dominance you have to if you have to prioritize price stability you really can't fight fight the climate crisis through a a, a systemic approach that both uh, um, rewards good performers and penalizes dirt, dirty performance. As with all of these things, it will require a lot of political will. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that was just a temporary setback. I agree with you. We will get there. Um, I'm aware that you have to go. Uh, so thank you so much for, for joining us. It's been a really interesting chat. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Hey, see you. Hey, what's going on here? Hey, where's my camera gone? <laughs> I can't I can't see my camera on my stream. <laughs> I'm gonna, am I gonna have to start a meeting with myself? Um no, because we just we'll just call it there. Um but yeah, that was really interesting. Um yeah, it's, God, uh, there's there's so many knots that we could have got into there with the details of the Wall Street consensus, but I'd recommend uh Daniela's work is really interesting um even if some of the finance stuff was a bit over my head at times uh, in those papers but yeah um like how the shadow banking system has proliferated and just created new money and how that now you know relates to and governs development and uh i think once you look at the shadow banking sector you're like huh maybe we really are looking at all the wrong things um but anyway yeah, I'll see you guys again soon. I'll I'll be doing a little gaming stream tomorrow on Unlearning, Unlearning Economics Live on Twitch, but uh we'll do uh maybe some more some more chats trying to get Isabella Weber to speak to me. You know, loads of stuff going on, maybe some research streams. By the way, my Thomas Sowell video, uh the script is now 22,000 words long for part 1. I'll leave you with that.